So how do we actually help compost? I want to talk to you about uh, five aspects. Most of the work in a compost bin is done by the bacteria. Yes, you have worms and you have other little animals eating bits and pieces, but most of the work is done by the bacteria. So if you want to compost successfully, what you've got to do is keep your bacteria happy. And you've got to, you've got to be kind to your bacteria and, and understand what they need and look after them. So the five things are, firstly, you've got to retain the heat. Bacteria like to be warm and cosy, and it, make, it allows them to sort of work more efficiently. So how do we actually do that? If you read, read some of the very old textbooks about hot composting, they'll talk about building huge great big mounds of compost, two meters square, piling all up in one go, and that will get hot. And what's actually happening there is, you know if you go outside and have a cup of tea for a, for a tea break during your garden, have a cup of tea, it'll go cold. The hot moves to the cold atmosphere. The same happens in your compost bin. The bacteria produce the heat, and it just dissipates off, and your compost bin cools down. So we've got two ways of preventing that happening. We can have a huge, great big half meter wide compost bin, and that slows down the heat flow, so the center stays warm and the outside is. Or we can replicate that by using modern materials. So you'll be all familiar with insulation that goes into your loft, these kind of insulation boards. They, that, that sort of 50 millimeters of, of insulation board has the same insulation properties as half a meter of compost. So you can create an insulated bin using these kind of materials. So the second thing that bacteria need is that they need food, they need a diet, they need the waste. And quite often if you look at the books, they talk about mixing greens and browns, and they talk about 30 to 1 night carbon to nitrogen ratio. What I'd like to suggest to you is you, you think about it as a little bit like a human diet. So you know that if you, if you get up in the morning and you have a famous drink for breakfast that's full of sugar, your children will be running around like that for about an hour while they burn off the sugar and then they'll flop as the sugar runs out. If you're a more mature person who has porridge for breakfast, you'll wake up and you'll go all the way through to lunch as those carbohydrates have been digested more slowly, so you get a slowly release of energy. Bacteria are very much similar. They can eat some things very quick and some things very slow. So in the easy to digest category, there are things like all food waste, because it's full of proteins and sugars, grass, comfrey, they're all nice and easy to digest. In the middle there's things like straw that are basically cellulose, most of the plant stores, bits and pieces, and at the far end, the difficult things that bacteria um, to digest are things like wood, lignin, all the hard, hard materials. So if you want to get your balance right, you want to get it hot, you've got to have a little bit of everything in there. The second thing to look at in terms of what bacteria like is, if you, if you look at a pinhead, they calculate you can get a million bacteria on a pinhead. So when you chop up your broccoli, and you've done all your vegetables, you're left with a little bit of store. You've got to now think about your little bacteria. That store, the outside of it, has a protective layer. It's designed by nature to protect it from bacterial attack. So if you put that whole stalk in your compost bin, the bacteria have to eat through that difficult stalk in out, out of coating, and then eat the whole great big thing. If you chop it in half, what actually happens is the bacteria can get into the soft inside, it's easier for them to digest, and they work a lot quicker. So if you can chop things up in a compost bin, they're going to compost a lot faster. It's almost twice as fast for every chop you make. So in the kitchen, is it viable to do that? Well, for me, it's quite straightforward. I have the whole family trained. When they're chopping the vegetables, it's quite often me chopping them, but when I chop the vegetables, I get them the store, I make one extra chop into two hot, and put it in the kitchen cabinet. Now, so if you, look, if you get in the habit of doing that, it's relatively straightforward, it takes an extra second. And outside in the garden, it's a little bit more challenging. You know, if you've shredded the heck, if you've got a great big container load, so trying to think about chopping all those bits up is a lot, a lot more difficult unless you've got a garden shredder. But the more you can chop, the easier it's going to go. So the third thing that the uh, bacteria um, need um, is, is oxygen. So to, to breathe and, to, and to, um, to work a little bit like a human body, they need to breathe in air. So you need to get air into the compost bin. So sometimes we talk about turning the compost bin to do that. When we were looking at the system, we looked at all sorts of aeration systems. We had, we had pipes with holes in this, uh, that way. We had all sorts of configurations. And what we found is that none of them really helped um, in terms of that thing. And we went back to some of the textbooks about how the chimney flow worked and how the air flows upwards. And, and what we actually found is that all these compost bins that were saying drill holes in the side for the air to get in don't actually work because what happens is the hot air just rises up the sides of the walls and out the top anyway. So you're not dragging air into the centre where, where the bacteria need it. 
So what you need to do is basically get your aeration to the, bottom, to the base of the bin and then let it flow out, which is great. It's fairly easy to put a, a plinth on your compost bin to, to, to allow the air in. But then you need to let it come out. And what actually happens here is, um, as, a, as the waste compresses down, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker and more and more dense. And that actually stops the airflow. So you have to have a technique to get the air, to allow the air to flow up. And the, the industrial systems use something called, complicated, called a bulking agent. And all the bulking agent is to us gardeners is wood chip, shredded wood chip. And the idea is that if you think about a pile of wood chip, and you stack it all on top of each other, it's a bit like children's building blocks. The wood chip doesn't break, press down, it stacks on top of each other, and that allows the air to flow. So if you add bulking agent into your compost bin, you'll find it'll actually aerate a lot easier. So the next, next thing that bacteria, bacteria need is water. And this one was a huge challenge to us for quite a long time, because a lot of, a lot of the composting books say you should make sure your compost is soaking wet, you know, you can squeeze out the water. And the more water we added, the worse our system became, if it, quite often with anaerobic. And what we realised is people were talking about the wrong thing. Yes, the bacteria need water. They need about 70, 60 to 70 percent water. But if you look at most waste, it actually has that amount of water in it. And the key thing is not about the water you can see; it's about the water you can't see. And the example I give you is a cucumber. So if you look at a cucumber, it has no visible water. But if you mush it all up, you'll end up with a pile of water. It's about 90 percent water. So there's loads of water actually in the materials. So very rarely in hot composting do you need to add extra water. In fact, quite the reverse. We're normally trying to add in more dry things to, to balance it off. So in summary then, the things that the bacteria need, we need to retain the heat, small bits, a mix of, of easy to digest and hard to digest, oxygen for them to breathe, and water. If you can get all those things together in a perfect balance, you get a, a nice virtuous circle and then you get beautiful compost. But if you get one of them slightly wrong, it spirals downwards and you end up with a black, smelly, grainy, mushy, awful mess. So is it, is it easy to achieve? Well, the industrial composting systems that the council operate do this day in, day out without any problem. There are lots of textbooks that tell you how to do the big, old, traditional composting without doing too much work, but you have to turn it. Or you can take modern materials and create a compost bin. So it is relatively easy to do as long as you've got the right system. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time about looking at compost quality. I don't know if anybody has ever thought about it, but this bucket contains about two litres of, of material. So it, if you fill it up with waste, it would be about a kilo. That kilo of waste produces about 250 grams of compost, so about a quarter. But compost is very different to the material that your garden needs. So when you look at the soil, and you look at you know, you know, the, the roots of the plants take up the nutrients and water, etc. So that's all, that's fine. But the thing that mediates how that works is a substance called humus. So when I talk about humus, I mean a defined set of chemicals. And they have this thing called water holding capacity, and they hold on to the nutrients and release some water. So the humus is what you're really aiming for. So this is what humus looks like. It's black, brown, but it's very, very sticky because it holds on to water. You get about two and a half grams of that out of your compost. So this is why they call it black gold. It's very, very difficult to produce. So can we produce more of this? Well, there's a, a scientific team in Aust Austria who gathered samples of compost from all over Europe, about 200 of them, and he analyzed how much of this was in each of the compost. And what it found is, in the poor of compost, there's about two and a half percent. In the very, very best compost, there was 50 percent. So a huge range of how much of this was being produced. So we want to produce more of this, um, and I'd love to stand here and tell you that hot composting will do that. The answer is it's a little bit more complicated. But what we do know is that this relies on two different components being in the waste. It, it, part, part of it is produced from the lignin in the wood, and part of it is produced from the proteins. Um, we get more proteins in food waste. So actually combining food waste with garden waste is a better combination of getting more of this. So that bit we do know, um, but in terms of some of the other conditions that result in this, um, we're, we're still working on them, and hopefully I'll be stood here in three years saying, we've cracked it, here's the method. But just yet, we haven't got that. So, 
that's, that's kind of where we are today. Thank you for listening. If anybody wants to look at these composts, we're actually going to take them back down to stand 204, which is just past the experts' theatre down here. Look for the big archway and the picture of the hot bit. So we're, we're going to open up for questions, but if you could just put your hand up, because he's been bringing the microphone, and it just makes it a little bit easier for everybody to hear the question. So we've got one down the front. Do you use for getting the protein into the Um Well, as you, as you probably know, all, all the plants have a little bit of protein in them to create the DNA. So all the plants have got sun. But in terms of high protein, you need to think about normally the food, food waste things, things like meat, fish, all, all the things in your diet that are high in protein um, are, are the same sort of thing. So, you know, if you look at most plants, they don't have a lot of proteins in them, but some do. Um, I'm trying to think of specific plants. I don't, I don't think I can think of a specific plant that's very high in protein. I tend to think about the meat and the fish being super high. Does that help? Any other questions? Oh, one over at the back. <laughs> with what composting is there any difference with tumor composting when it comes to um, so I think there are two parts of that. Is, is, is there any difference about things you can put in and is there any difference with the bacteria that work? The end result. So in terms of the bacteria in the hot compost system, what you tend to get is a different group of bacteria work at the higher temperatures. So they work, do their little piece, and then when they finish it, other bacteria will come back and take over. In terms of what that means, in terms of the things you can put in there, it means you can put in a lot, a lot more, a lot more of things like the weed seeds that were normally compost. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Good. Right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're going to disappear off down to stand two or four. If anybody wants to come and look at the systems, thank you very much. Have a good day. Okay.